All are welcome here. This is definitely one of the tenets that Unitarians hold closely. But how good are we at actually welcoming people? Earlier this month, I spoke about the Unitarian Universalist Association's Commission on Institutional Change, a commission that was set with the charge to conduct an audit of the power structures and analyze systemic racism and white supremacy culture within the UUA. A charge that indeed implies that perhaps we are not very good at welcoming all. And it was discovered through three years of interviews, surveys, focus groups, testimonials, two outside audits, and many social science research tools that the report articulated not only are Unitarian Universalist organizations within North America bad at welcoming Black, Indigenous, and people of color, but also members from numerous different minorities and marginalized groups, such as from the LGBTQ plus community, people with disabilities, youth and young adults, and many other groups that were only briefly mentioned. If we are a denomination that prides itself on being welcoming and encouraging members from every avenue of society to gather with us, why would the commission's report articulate that we do such a poor job at welcoming others and seeking out members of marginalized groups to be leaders? I would like to theorize that it is because we believe that we are a beloved community. Rather than knowing that we are on the road toward beloved community and need others to join us. Perhaps this is too nuanced, but I'm hoping that we can unpack the difference in these two behaviors and the tendencies within these two camps, if we wanna call them that. In our story this morning, Amelia believed that she needed superpowers in order to make a difference in the community around her, when really all she did was act kindly, bravely, and generously. I would argue that Unitarian communities and individuals within our communities also need to change our behaviors. I have been spending a lot of time over the last few years focusing on learning about systemic racism and anti-oppression and multiculturalism within our communities. And I've been shifting my understanding of how to behave, what is welcoming, and how my interactions might be less welcoming than I intend them to be. Instead of assuming that I would be welcoming and supportive to newcomers within our midst, I've had to retrain myself and learn new ways of interacting with individuals. And I am still learning how to welcome people. In fact, I recently heard from somebody who is very interested in participating with our community that we did not do a good job of welcoming them and they have stopped engaging with us. Instead of believing that we are already a community who welcomes everyone, what if we practice what it means to welcome people? Instead of believing that we will get along with and always be like-minded with and agree upon everything together, I believe we need to practice what it means to disagree, to have differences of opinion, and to continue to be in relationship together. I believe that we forget that there is work to be done if we believe that we already have beloved community. Uh, if I am coming to a beloved community every Sunday, a group of people that I am in relationship with that I get to sing with and worship with and believe we are a beloved community, then I don't feel the need to change anything that is happening here because we already have it. We have already achieved what needs to be achieved. And sure, we can work for justice for other people, justice for the earth and for animals. But if I am part of a beloved community, then nothing about my community needs to change and maybe nothing about me needs to change. It is like Amelia. She forgot that she needed to sit down next to Bobby and make him feel welcomed. She needed to take a stand against the bullies and she needed to begin cleaning up the park. 
She believed that it was because she had superpowers, but really it was just because she shifted the way that she was interacting with the world. Last week, I shared the quote from Alex Capitan and Reverend Michael Slack, two founders of the Transforming Hearts Collective. They said, quote, beloved community is not devoid of conflict. And this one is really hard. Beloved community is not easy. There is nothing easy about practicing beloved community. When we avoid conflict in order to get along, we are not practicing beloved community because beloved community exists when we trust each other. We have the relationships, the strong enough relationships to actually disagree with each other, to be in conflict, even to risk hurting each other. And we can stay in relationships through those disagreements and conflict and potential hurt. That is practicing beloved community, end quote. Staying in community and staying in hard conversations has been challenging for this group. I believe it's actually a challenge for practically any group of white people because white supremacy culture has taught us that conflict is bad and we need to avoid it in order to get along. But really avoiding conflict is not going to help us get along. It is going to create toxic situations which ripple out from the people in conflict and cause tension within everyone in the surrounding system. When there is conflict in a system that has not been engaged, that has been ignored, then people begin to respond from their fight or flight reflexive system rather than making decisions based on values and principles. Although there might only be a conflict between a few individuals, the tension that exists within those two individuals the avoidance, the anxiety that sources from one situation ripples out into everyone else. We see this in so many other scenarios, not just our church community. Faith system or family system. When mom is having a bad day, everyone is having a bad day. Or when dad is angry, everyone stays out of it his way. This is probably common to some people. The same is true for offices or other job scenarios. When the administrator is upset, information is not shared properly. If the manager is upset and gets stressed with the supervisor, you better believe that things will continue to move down the line. Conflict, especially conflict that is not handled and engaged properly, upsets an entire system. And if conflict is left unengaged long enough, or if people do not shift their behavior after conflict has been addressed, the system holds on to that conflict and doesn't let the tension go, always assuming something else is going to happen. Changing these tendencies, changing the way in which we interact with one another and making steps towards a healthier system is what acting like a beloved community looks like. Figuring out where we are struggling with our welcoming practices or our conflict avoidances or with our system practices is the first action towards a beloved community. We are not a beloved community, but we can practice and we can move along the road towards becoming a beloved community. That is how we shift away from believing that we are a beloved community a community that has it all figured out into a group of people who are taking action towards beloved community. This is how we change beloved community from a thing that we embody to a thing we act for into a verb. Working towards becoming a more welcoming community or towards becoming more anti-racist or towards becoming more anti-oppressive is a significant shift that will require many levels of change. But if we understand that beloved community is something that we do as an action and not a place that we already are, those changes will become easier to manage and easier to overcome. I have previously talked about a theory of change called the trans theoretical model of change. 
but I wanna lift it up again here today. The trans theoretical model has five distinct stages and we move through those stages in a sort of spiral of sorts, going around and around, but sometimes moving a little further up each time. The first stage is pre-contemplation. This is where there is no intention of changing a behavior. Next, we move into contemplation. We become aware a problem exists, but we have no commitment to action. Preparation is the intention of taking action to address the problem. Action is the active modification of behavior change. Maintenance is the sustained change. New behavior replaces old behavior. And the final stage is called termination, when there is zero temptation in returning to the old habit. For an example of moving through these stages of change, I will use my own history of healthy eating. Last fall and into the holiday season, I had absolutely no desire to eat healthy. We were regularly buying tubs of ice cream and bags of chips. There were a lot less vegetables in our grocery cart and we made a lot of cookies and dessert items. At this point in time, I was in pre-contemplation pre stage. I had not even thought about switching my behaviors. However, around the beginning of December, I started to recognize that I was unhappy with my choice and began considering how I would change my behavior. Perhaps I needed to go outside more, or maybe I wanted to take up running or jumping skipping rope. I knew I was feeling lumpy and lethargic and I knew something needed to change, but I wasn't sure yet what it would be. This would have been the contemplation stage. I began trying things on. I downloaded a running app and I attempted to start a running program. We stopped buying ice cream and cut back on some of the other junk food. This would be considered the preparation stages of change. I was trying to figure out what was going to work for me. When I stepped into the action stage of change, I had decided to begin writing down what I was eating every day. This encouraged me to make healthier decisions and create healthier plans for grocery shopping. I would say that I'm still in the action stage of change because I still have to regularly keep track of what I'm eating and I still have to make plans for my meals and grocery cart. When I get into a place where healthy eating becomes more of a habit than something that I have to practice at, we move in, we would be moving towards the stage of maintenance. When I think about the stages of change when it comes to acting as a beloved community, I believe that I am in the preparation stage. I've left the stage of pre-contemplation and contemplation behind. I have readily recognized that there is a need to change and recognize that this is a shift that is on my shoulders to do. But I'm still attempting to understand what the right way of acting is for me. What is the right way in which I can become more welcoming or less shy or more outgoing? What is the right way for me to be anti-racist and anti-oppressive? And how do I shift the ingrained patterns that are already in my life? Perhaps you believe that Colonial Unitarians is a beloved community and that we do welcome everyone. This might be considered the pre-contemplation stage of change. But if you have been considering over the last month different ways in which changing our behavior can help us create beloved community, that beloved community is something that we do and not something we are, then perhaps you are in the contemplation stage. I hope that we can begin taking beloved community action together. At our general meeting this afternoon, within every one of our interactions amongst each other and with the new people who join us and want to walk the path of beloved community together. Perhaps we could become the little church on the corner of Bertram and Coston, much like the fig tree, serving so many strangers, maybe nevermore. Let us make that happen.